Welcome to Choices. On this show, we interview healthcare practitioners from Southern Vancouver Island, the Gulf Islands, and we discuss with them the options, the choices that they offer for us in our healthcare. Today, we are on location at the Pacific Rim College in beautiful downtown Victoria, and it is my pleasure to introduce James Christian. Welcome to the show, James. Thank you. Uh, James is the director of the Pacific Rim College and the dean of the School of Western Medicine. Uh, he currently holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Western Medicine, uh, Western Herbal Medicine, uh, from the University of Wales, and is currently also pursuing a master's degree, I understand, mm -hmm. as well in herbal medicine. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Uh, maybe we can start off by you explaining to us um, what would be the typical training that a uh, herbalist would have, uh, particularly in, in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. So currently there's no regulations for herbal medicine in British Columbia. Um, it's, it's regulated on a provincial level, and at, at current there isn't anything that's going on within the province of BC. So there's a, a, a lot of various training programs that exist. Some range from anything like about a weekend to the program that we offer here, which is a three-year diploma program. Okay. Um, so there are professional associations of herbal medicine, and the one that's probably the most um, current in British Columbia is the Canadian Herbalist Association of British Columbia. Okay. Uh, and rather than recognizing any one particular school, what they do is that they require that students actually have a specific amount of training in various um, health sciences. Yeah. So they look at biomedical sciences and clinical training and materia medica and herbal medicine. And as long as you meet those requirements, regardless of how that is, so through apprenticeship, through personal training, through college diplomas, uh, then you're eligible to meet the requirements for entrance. Okay. So, uh, so there's a lot of fluctuation. Mm -hmm. So it, it sort of depends on the individual how much training they, they feel like they would like to get. Uh, but as regulations are coming around the world, which did begin in the UK for herbal medicine, uh, their minimum requirement is a four-year Bachelor of Science degree. Yeah. So it seems like the, the momentum is heading towards something at least three or four years to bring us in line with other healthcare modalities, you know, massage therapy and acupuncture and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, how would a consumer of this uh, of, of herbal medicine then know when they're walking into somebody's office uh, how well they're trained? Yeah, so it would be really important for the public to actually try to determine the qualifications that the practitioner has uh, because, you know, as we'll talk about later, some of the plants that we do use are relatively safe mm -hmm. uh, for the general public to use, but there are plants that you have to be cautious of using uh, regarding dosage and regarding uh, herb-drug interactions. Mm -hmm. So if people are taking pharmaceutical medications, you, you need to be aware that some herbs can't be taken at the same time. Okay. Um, so one of the best things that the public can do is to actually uh, ask what qualifications the practitioner has, and if they're a member in good standing of any professional herbal association, because herbal associations are the ones that require uh, liability insurance, and they're the ones that monitor your educational level and make sure that you're doing continuous educational improvements. Now this association, would they be issuing um, members certificates that would be on the wall? They do have certificates. So they could look for those then when they enter yep. the office? You can do that and on the website, uh, if you go to the CHA of BC website, they do actually have a list of professional members. Okay. So you know, depending on where you are in British Columbia, or Victoria, or Vancouver, uh, you can actually click on that location and, and get an idea of what the qualified practitioners are in your location. Okay, yeah, wonderful. You mentioned uh, the interaction between pharmaceuticals and herbals. That leads into my next question. What would, what would cause somebody to choose a route of going towards uh, pharmaceutical treatment uh, compared to herbal medicine treatment? What, would, what do you see the difference there? Well, I think one of the current trends that we notice in the clinic is that people are feeling more empowered by seeing a natural health care practitioner, so whether that's herbal medicine or acupuncture. Uh, but people feel like the, the health care system currently isn't addressing all of their needs. Uh, people are car compartmentalized. You know, so you go in with a, with a health concern that might be systemic, but you're told to, to see specific specialists for different areas of your body, and right. you're sort of teased apart, and no one really looks at you as a whole being. Yeah. Um, so herbal medicine specifically really addresses the whole individual, and that goes beyond even the physical part of the body. We're looking at their mental health, their emotional health, even their spiritual health. Um, so I think people are really um, interested in, in sort of taking that on and, and recognizing that there's a lot more to uh, health. So that's one issue, is that we look at the person as a whole. The other thing is that uh, pharmaceuticals do have you know, a fair number of side effects. Mm -hmm. you know, it's definitely a risk and reward kind of situation that you know, as a, a medical doctor, they, they should tell you, here's the benefits of using this drug, but at the same time, here's the potential side effects. Right, and, right. You know, it is up to the individual to make that decision that they want to take that. So sometimes we use herbs alongside pharmaceuticals, which is definitely a possibility. Okay. You know, if a pharmaceutical is absolutely necessary, in some cases, you know, it is, mm -hmm. uh, we can offset some of the side effects by using herbs. Oh, wonderful. Uh, but some people choose to, to use herbs because we can actually customize a formulation directly for an individual. 
So not like a, a pharmaceutical where a pharmacist might have to put together certain drugs for an individual. Um, we can customize a, a, an, an organic uh, herbal formulation, whether it's by tincture or tea or capsules, specifically for that person. Okay. So trying to address everything at the core level. Right. Um, so very individualized um, formulation, and unlike the pharmaceuticals, which are one one fits all. Exactly. Uh, which we find, you know, with working with herbs, is that one size doesn't fit all. No, it doesn't. You know, even a herb that it's sort of like an eighty twenty rule. You know, chamomile works for a lot of people, but there's still going to be a small percentage of the population that that don't find it relaxing, that don't find it you know, easing for digestive concerns. Right. Okay. So we just need to be able to be flexible about modifying that for people. Excellent. I mean, another great thing is that we get to try all of the medicines. You know, so studying herbal medicine requires that you build a relationship with them. Which is not something you'd want to do with pharmaceuticals exactly. if you were yeah. <laughs> if yes. you were a medical student. Exactly. Okay. okay. So I uh, gather your health improved then as you were studying? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's things. the general trend, you know, okay. is that people become healthier as they're studying because it causes them to look inward as they're studying and sort of recognizing why they've chosen a path of healthcare in the first place but working with the herbs. I guess that would be another way that uh, a consumer could discriminate on the modality they're choosing is the health of the practitioner. If exactly. the practitioner is not very healthy, that might indicate something. Yeah. I would, to me it would, anyway. Yeah, for sure, and that's up to the individual to make that decision. Yeah. Sure. Um, you mentioned um, some of the herbs that might have to have a little more caution with. Can you tell us a few herbs that you might have to be aware of? Yeah, I mean, so it depends on the individual. I mean, something as simple as chamomile, like I mentioned, you know, it's mm -hmm. a member of the Asteraceae family, and a lot of people will have allergies to that sort of family of plants. Okay. Um, so potential contact, dermatitis, uh, to allergic types of reactions, it's really minimal. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, something as simple as that, which could affect anybody, um, ranging up to something that might be used inappropriately, like ephedra, which you know, was used probably about a decade ago yes. and hit the news. And, mm -hmm. and I remember reading that, yes. Yeah. So this is a herb that, I mean, they found traces of the plant used in burial ceremonies in Iraq 60,000 years ago, okay. you know, indicating that this is a plant that's been used by human civilization for a long period of time, um, safely and effectively. But uh, the problem usually comes when herbs are taken out of context. Right. You know, so one of the actions, you know, the traditional use of the ephedra is a nasal decongestant and mm -hmm. for allergies. Okay. Um, so, and it works powerfully, you know, for that regard. So asthma, allergies, things like that, hay fever. Um, it does have uh, the ability to sort of be a little bit stimulating and increase heart rate. So people were using it to, to increase metabolism. I remember that they were using it in athletic endeavors. Exactly. Trying to with a bit of um, creatine and things mixed together exactly. inappropriately. Yeah, so it was used out of context. Right. Uh, and then the herb is actually blamed for the issue yes. rather yes. than, you know, the, the out of context. The other thing is that sometimes they'll do... Um, extracts of the plant. So they'll take one specific chemical constituent out of the plant mm -hmm. and use that and call it after the name of the plant. So that you think you're getting a whole plant, but you're not. Okay. Uh, and one of the things that happens with the whole plant is that there's synergy amongst sure. the different constituents. So, you know, in ephedra, there are constituents that raise blood pressure and increase your heart rate, but there are others that actually balance it. So if you take the whole thing, you shouldn't have such a dramatic effect. Okay. Uh, so herbs like that just have to be cautious about dosage and just using them appropriately, mm -hmm. which is why I think it would be important to see a, a professional practitioner. Sure. Well, you just mentioned the chamomile. You know, if someone was drinking chamomile as an herbal alternative, say, to caffeine mm -hmm. and getting dermatitis, they may not put the two of them together. Exactly. They might keep yeah. drinking the chamomile and still consuming it, yeah. still showing up the dermatitis. Exactly. And this is one of the issues that we have with, with herbal medicine is that, you know, it's definitely the medicine of the people. Y you know, um, the World Health Organization describes herbal medicine as, you know, a basic human right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we still haven't reached the point where we recognize that it is a medicine right. and that it does need to be respected in that, in that way. Right. You know, right. that uh, while chamomile might grow, might grow in your backyard, you know, it might not be the appropriate plant for you. For you, yeah, yeah. yeah. interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, now let's go down and have a look at some of the different preparations you sure. were going to show us. Yeah, of course. Come on down. So James is going to explain to us and show us some different examples of herbal preparations. I know sometimes I hear confusion um, with uh, some people as to what is a what is a tincture, what is a decoction, uh, how are the herbs used, and also then equally how do I apply them. So James, thank you for showing us. We've got um, a tincture. Mm -hmm. So these are tinctures, uh, which are basically just alcohol and water extracts of plants. So the whole the whole part of the plant that we're using is used. Okay. So if it's like the root or the flower or the leaves, uh, we take that entire part of the plant, we grind it up. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be done fresh, it can be done dried. Okay. Uh, and then you pour over the menstruum, which is the water and alcohol liquid, mm -hmm. and you let it sit for anywhere from two weeks to four weeks to allow all of the medicinal properties of the plant to be extracted into the liquid. Okay. And uh, what, uh, what percentage of alcohol would they be? So it varies anywhere from between 25% to 90%. 
Oh. And the reason that there's that fluctuation is just based on the chemical constituents that, that exist within the plant. Okay. So the higher the fat soluble content is, the higher the alcohol, right. and the more water soluble the, the components of the plant are, the lower the, the alcohol percentage. Okay. Twenty five percent is sort of the minimum for preservation. Okay. So you won't really see anything less than twenty five percent. Ninety percent is the, the strongest. Okay. All right. Um, so what we have here, and you could probably see somewhat behind me, is that they're all individualized. Mm -hmm. So this formula is a pretty simple, straightforward formula that I use a lot for people that have like a cold or a flu. Uh, obviously, it would be customized to them if there were specific, you know, symptoms that they actually had, or right. you know, an underlying reason why they were being more prone to getting an infection. Sure. But just you know, a standalone something that you know for most people they would be able to use. This is echinacea, elderberry, and ginger. Yeah, okay. And so the combination of these things together, you would just shake it up just to make sure that it's all. Blend it properly. Uh, I'll measure out uh, 50 milliliters. Very timely, uh, seasonally timely. Formula. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we go through a lot of um, these kinds of herbs at this time of year. Mm -hmm. So we pour out the herbs, and as I make them, I'm turning them around just in case uh, someone talks to me and I have to remember which ones I need to pour again. Uh, good idea. Just as like a safety precaution. And you notice that they're all different colors, mm -hmm. which is important because a lot of people think that uh, tinctures are all just brown liquids, right. but they should actually smell like the original plant and they should have the colors of the original plant. Exactly. So you will find greens and yellows and um, okay. reds and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. yeah. and then so it, even, it even looks Christmassy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And this is ginger. And because this has got a higher alcohol content, you'll see that it changes the... Oh, it does? Yeah. And so that would be it. So this would be uh, a simple one-week formula that some of you would okay. take, mm -hmm. uh, customize as a tincture, yep. and then you would just put it in the bottle for them. Now how many drops would a person use how many times a day? Uh, depending on what the condition is, and uh, you know, sort of their age and things like that. But this would be really useful in times of real infection, about 10 milliliters, mm -hmm. um, three times a day. Okay, so fairly intense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, things with echinacea, and with this herb specifically, it does get used a lot, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes I think it gets overused. It's mm -hmm. not the kind of plant that I think you have to use on a daily basis. Right. Um, you know, we have a fully functioning immune system for mm -hmm. most people, mm -hmm. and it needs to be worked. Right. You know, it, it needs to be exercised just like any muscle. If you don't use it, it's actually going to become weaker. And you miss that whole approach again to the body. Exactly. Yeah. So what I would recommend is, if you happen to be around somebody at work or at school that was sick, and you... You know, maybe your sleep habits were a little bit disturbed, you weren't eating properly, and you were actually concerned that you might become ill. Mm -hmm. Then I would say echinacea is great for the next few days. If you don't get sick, stop taking it. Stop taking it. You know, but if you start to feel that onset of a cold coming on, then I would start taking it right away. Right. Um, right. And echinacea tincture, one of the constituents in it has this um, sensation of causing like a tingling, numbing sensation on your tongue and in your mouth. Okay. Uh, and that's actually one of the constituents that has its immune modulating properties. So if you don't get that sensation in your mouth, you're not going to have the immune. Response. Response. Yeah. Yeah. It's good, yeah. good to know them yeah. when you're consuming it. And it. Yeah. And it also means that you're not having allergic reaction to it. <laughs> okay. that, that's a normal response in your mouth to have some tingling sensation. So it's always good to make people aware. Of yeah. yeah. So that would be a tincture. Okay. Um, now, if someone came into the into the yeah. facilities here, how much would that cost? Uh, so buy? on a week, it would be fifteen dollars. Fifteen dollars. So for about hundred milliliters is about fifteen dollars. So very reasonable then. Yeah. Considering what you're going to pay for a cold medication. Exactly. So we're about two dollars a day for customized organic herbal medicine, yeah. which you know compared to a lot of pharmaceuticals is a lot cheaper. Yeah. Especially considering that we can blend something specifically to address most of the things that are going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. So we do actually have tinctures that are made with glycerin instead, which is a vegetable oil derivative right. uh, for anyone who has issues with alcohol. Okay. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can mix uh, each one of these doses with some boiling hot water, and that will evaporate most of the alcohol off. Right. That's what I do with yeah. I can't. I can't take the alcohol first thing in the morning, so yeah. I hit it with hot water. Exactly. Yeah. So there are options for that. Yeah. Um, so that would be a tincture. Again, like uh, we customize that for individuals. Okay. Another thing might be to uh, make customized creams for individuals. Okay. So we start with standard base creams that we uh, get from a company in the UK that are organic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can customize those depending on what you need by adding different infused oils, essential oils, tinctures uh, into the cream base and mixing that up. So okay. we can take something that generally has no real medicinal benefits and then tailor to whatever need we have. Okay. So if you, you know, someone came in maybe with athlete's foot, or ringworm, or psoriasis, or eczema, then we can actually address that by making a cream. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And you're, again, custom formulated. Custom formulated, yeah. Oh, so we would just measure a, a portion of the base cream, and then in a bowl, just blend together some tinctures and oils, mix it all together, and then put it into a jar for that. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. Uh, another, yeah, another format would be dried herbs. So these uh, are the exact same herbs that I just did for the cold and flu tincture. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, blending those together, we would just mix them into a bag, mm -hmm. you know, for the individual, so that not separated, that would actually be all um, combined. Mm -hmm. And then we would give them instructions about either steeping it as a tea, which would be an infusion. Okay. So people hear the word infusion, they're not quite sure what that means. It's, it's a tea. Tea. Yeah. Okay. So if you've made tea at home, you've made an infusion. Okay. Um, okay. The difference is something called a decoction, right? Uh, which okay. is used a lot in Chinese medicine. Okay. Uh, and a decoction is actually like a, a soup or a stew. So it's actually actively boiling the herbs together in water. And so one of the main differences that we do uh, for separating those two is that herbs that are, you know, a lot more woodier or heavier, so berries, roots, seeds, things like that, mm -hmm. will do a decoction just by the nature of the material. They actually don't release their compounds very well into water, okay. so they need like active to be actively boiled. Right. Uh, but then the softer parts of plants, like the flowers, the stems, the leaves, uh, generally release their constituents really quickly. And so a tea or infusion would be the way that we would do it. So that's sort of generally the reason why we separate the two. Okay. Uh, infusions tend to be easier for people because they're familiar with the process. You know, put a teaspoon in a teapot, add some hot water, cover it. Right. You know, definitely covering your tea is very important because certain herbs have a lot of aromatic compounds like chamomile. Right. So the fact that you can smell your tea brewing is great, but, but you're losing the medicinal properties to sure. the air. So you want to make sure that it's covered so that it's actually in the tea that you're drinking. Okay. Um, yeah. And then a decoction for some people is a little bit more challenging because it does take several hours. Uh, and it does have a, a really strong flavor because you're actually reducing, you know, the yeah. liquid down to a really small amount. Well, then the Chinese herbs I've taken in the past that I, I decocted down myself at home, uh, the flavor is unbelievable. Yeah. It's, it's so hard to explain what it is you're drinking. My, my mouth, mouth yeah. doesn't even know what to say. Exactly. Yeah, but it works. I, I always found it very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we do have other options. We do make capsules. Mm. So we could blend the tea formula together and rather than just putting that into a bag and having you make an infusion with it, we use grinders like the mortar and the pestle or the uh, like a, a, a herb grinder mm -hmm. and we would grind that up and then put it into capsules and you could use it that way as well. Why one way or the other? What would be the advantage? Some people for traveling, you know, if they're working, you know, have to leave house, or, uh, leave their home early in the morning or they're at their office late, mm -hmm. things like that, then uh, making a tea isn't necessarily the most convenient for them. Okay. Um, you know, some people find just the convenience of taking a capsule easier. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And then depending on where we want to actually address conditions within the body. I mean, lower down in the digestive system, sometimes capsules are better because they hold everything together. Right passing through the stomach, you know, and then as it sort of moves through the digestive system, opens up and starts to give its actions for the sure. Journey. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask you, how do people access this service then? So we do have herbal clinics and acupuncture clinics and nutrition clinics here at the college. Okay. Uh, both the nutrition and the herbal clinics are free. Okay. So there's no cost for the consultation. So if you have wow. any health concerns uh, and you're looking for advice on what herbs to take and what might be med beneficial for you, uh, you can make an appointment or just you better be careful what you offer yeah. you might be uh, <laughs> we have lots of clinics so yeah we're always okay well, we're well. so uh, add a call and make an appointment or just drop in there might be an available opening for you okay uh, it'll take about an hour to an hour and a half of your time to really discuss everything that's going on with your health okay. so they're very thorough they mm -hmm. want to know you know what's brought you in but also look at your diet social habits past medical history you know things like that okay uh, and then what they'll do is they'll customize a herbal formula for you and it's up to you. We can just write it down for you and suggest, you know, here's the herbs that we think would be relevant and you can buy them anywhere in the community. Or, you know, here at the dispensary where we have all of these organic herbs, we can customize for it and customize it for you and uh, provide them and then provide the consultation. Wonderful, wonderful service. Yeah. So those will be uh, students at the end of their training and they're supervised by an herbalist? Uh, it, it's all through the, the training. So the students the training. in year one begin clinical training. Okay. So in year one, they're actually with a supervisor the entire time. So mm -hmm. someone like myself would be in the room with them, mm -hmm. and I would be doing the consultation. Oh, so I see. you'd be seeing me directly, but there'd be students watching. Okay. Uh, and then as they move through their program, they start to do the consultation with a supervisor watching them. Okay. And then in their third and final year, they're doing the consultation on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, and then before they make any medicine, before they make any recommendations, they have to check with their instructor. Oh, and excellent. as long as everything seems safe and the dosages are fine, there's no concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, then they're good, you know, they're good to go ahead and just follow up. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I'd like to thank you, James, for yeah. coming on the show and sharing this. It's all this knowledge. It's wonderful. My name is Cameron Moffat. I'm an osteopathic practitioner here in Victoria. And on behalf of myself and the crew at Cable 4, I'd like to thank you for watching the show Choices. And we hope that you found it informative and offer you some choices for your health care. Next episode, we're going to be meeting with a chiropractor who offers a very different and interesting way of working with the body. So until then, thank you very much for watching. Have yourself a merry and healthy uh, Christmas, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.